Good afternoon, distinguished guests. Hello. Hello. My name is David Wolbrecht. I support civic engagement for the city of Kirkland. Thank you for coming today, which is really just the start of a larger conversation. Today we'll hear about the importance of the decennial census, about some challenges and opportunities for our communities here on the east side, and about how you all might get involved in this important work. And to welcome us here today is Mayor John Marcioni from Redmond. Mayor Marcioni. Thank you, David. Well, good afternoon, and you know, three o'clock on a, I want to say Friday, Thursday afternoon. Uh, it's, it's, you got to get that energy going. I hear there's people here, uh, of course, locally uh, within King County. Uh, anyone from outside King County, raise your hand. And then outside of state, are you the one from California? Well, thank you for coming up. Our weather is this beautiful all the time. Uh, are you from North or South Cal uh, California? Southern California. Or in Southern California. Yeah, so this, this is probably cold for you. Uh, I'm from D.C. originally. I've been both there for years. Oh, okay. So this is, okay. Well, you've, you've felt the extremes then. Uh, as you know, um, I want, so we have a couple elected officials. First, we have Julie Wise. Julie uh, is our director of elections. Uh, and then is Penny Sweet here. And, um, and we might have a couple other elected officials drop by as time goes by. Um, so the overview of today is one is to learn and we're going to learn in the next few hours uh, why getting a complete and accurate count is important. Just the fact that you're here you probably know is important. Um, I was reflecting on the diversity that's on the east side. Now I grew up here, I've lived here since 1969 and in 69, Redmond was 98% white, according to the census. And today, our best numbers say we're about 58% white. And so we want to capture the diversity. We want to capture the population. I, mean, I know the same for Bellevue and Kirkland and the other cities on the east side. But it's important that we go out there and, and find people. We also have challenges in doing that. We face uh, challenges in the coming year of um, people being afraid of you being a government official coming to their door. What are you up for? Um, as, it's, as someone who has doorbelled houses, you get that suspicion sometimes. Um, and we want to answer your questions so that when you're knowledgeable and you can help spread the knowledge to co-workers who will be working on the census next year. So there is a East King County Census Task Force, or also known as the Complete Count Committee. Um, and this is, uh, we're going to be identifying leaders from different sections. We're going to uh, ask superintendents, local government elected officials and staff, uh, business and faith leaders, uh, as well as social service, housing, health agencies, and then community cultural community leaders. We want to reach out to as many groups as we can to get them involved also. And, and that, that's going to take some work and effort also um, to, to do that and lay the foundation in 2019 so in 2020 we can do a more thorough and complete job. So these are all our neighbors. They work with us. They play with us. Uh, they live next to us, they live around the corner, they dine in the same restaurants as us. We want to capture our whole community. It has financial impacts for federal money, and it has um, uh, impacts uh, for state money, but also has impacts in knowing what kind of services we need to deliver, whether you're a social service group or whether you're a city. Knowing who your customer is is very important, and knowing how many customers you have is also very important. So I want to welcome you and thank you for coming today. Thank you for helping uh, uh, really kick this off. It's, uh, it looks like a full 18-month uh, effort. And, um, and then, of course, welcome to Redmond. And if, if you want to get, if you want to practice, we have a number of restaurants on Cleveland Street that you can go door to door and ask about each of their foods and so forth. That'll help you practice counting. Whoever has the, the closest number of restaurants um, wins a pastry. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back to David. David, thanks for being our MC today. 
Yeah, thank you, Mayor Marcioni. Um, so our keynote speaker today uh, is King County Elections Director Julie Wise. And Director Wise was elected in November of 2015 and has served King County for more than 18 years as a champion of best practices in election administration within King County and throughout Washington State. So please welcome King County Elections Director Julie Weiss. <laughs> okay, we're green. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So, excited to be here with you this afternoon. I don't know if I've ever been a keynote speaker for anything, and here they have me, the elections director for census. So, I'm really excited to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I told David, so don't, don't be alarmed if David starts frantically moving his arms. I told him that anyone said that Julie could talk for 20 minutes was lying to him because I have a speaking problem, okay? So um, he's going to be flashing me some different times to tell me to wrap it up. So I'm probably already five minutes in, right? Okay. <laughs> so it's beautiful out. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous building. I was greeted by a squirrel out front. Did anyone else? No? I think it was looking for a little snack from me. I didn't have anything for it. So, um, so this afternoon, of course, we're going to talk about the census, but I am an elected official, so it's basically a mandate to have an entire slide about myself. Um, so I'm, again, Julie Wise. As David mentioned, I've worked at King County Elections for 18 years. They were hiring 12-year-olds at that time. <laughs> um, but I am, this is a slide to tell you that I'm the elected director of elections. That's how we roll in King County. We elect the person that runs elections. Um, not only being there at elections for the last 18 years, I was also the deputy before that. And that's a slide to tell you that I'm a total election geek. I'm certified at the state level and the national level um, as an election administrator. So that's a little bit about me. Can I just see um, who do we have sort of re representing our community-based organizations here this afternoon? Wonderful. Hi, Mr. Hi, Robert. Hi. Um, how about cities? Yeah, wow, fantastic. That's a great. Okay, so I believe, just one more slide about me, I promise. Um, I believe that my job as being elected the director of elections for King County is my priority is to remove barriers to voting and therefore increasing access. It should really be as easy as possible. Your friends are waving you right over here. You can come right in front. It does not, it does not, not at all. This is an informal gathering. Um, and so I really believe that over especially the last three and a half years, that's what we've been doing at King County elections. So some pictures of what we've been working on drop boxes. Right? We've added 56 drop boxes in King County since I was elected. We had 10 when I started for 1.3 million. That doesn't work. There's a beautiful one right out front in the turnaround there you can see. Um, we've, of course, also moved to prepaid postage in King County, kind of forced the issue for the rest of the state to follow suit as well. We've added languages that we provide our election materials into, all while at the same time ensuring that we have accurate, secure, fair, open elections at the same time. So let's get really into the meat of it. So the 2020 census, I'm not sure if this is alarming to you all, 361 days, I'm probably all aware of that, and April 1st, 2020 is uh, when that will be kicking off. So um, to be honest with you, like I said, I was a little bit surprised to be asked to be a keynote speaker specifically about the census as I am clearly an elections geek, and that is my subject matter expertise. And then I thought, well, shouldn't we all actually be census geeks and really have that be our expertise? So I'm happy to be here not only speaking with you this afternoon, but also learning with you this afternoon as well. So the 2020 census is less than a year away. Jur jurisdictions, of course, have a lot at stake um, in terms of funding, political representation, um, and quality data for making decisions about our communities. Really, an undercount is going to mean less funding for critical projects. And I'm going to talk about some of those projects that we've seen um, completed before. So it's abs absolutely necessary, as you all know why you're here today, that we count everyone and that we ensure that those who have immigrated to this country feel safe participating and not further isolated by the census process. Funny little typo in this, if you can holler out where the typo is, that would be 17 billion. 
Just a little mistake there. Um, so $17 billion, nearly $17 billion in funding for Washington State, not million. Um, and so these um, included programs uh, and grants from programs such as Medicaid, highway planning and construction, Title I grants and local education agencies, special education grants, national school lunch program, Head Start, early Head Start, supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children, state children's health insurance program, foster care, and low-income housing energy assistance. So um, again, since the 2010 census, I'm going to use City of Bellevue as an example in this presentation, has received over $76.2 million for transportation capital projects, over $7 million in park capital projects, and nearly $6 million in community development uh, block grants for distribution in Bellevue's human service agencies. So performing an accurate population count in the 2020 census will help ensure Bellevue, for example, continues to receive its fair share of federal, state, and county funds. We had so many examples. Uh, Gwen helped me uh, with a ton of different examples, and people from Bellevue are welcome to holler out more, but some examples that we've got up on the screen um, are absolutely critical to infrastructure projects in Bellevue, specifically the Northeast 4th Street extension, the 120th Avenue Northeast, and utility. Bellevue folks, do you want to holler out any other ones? This is a, no? Okay, that's fair. All right, thank you. What's at stake? I could literally probably just say a lot and drop the microphone, right? So there's a lot at stake. One, representation, right? So a complete and accurate count ensures we're going to have fair representation on the United States House of Representatives and in redistricting our state legislatures. In 2010, Washington State gained a seat from nine to 10 representatives in the House. From 2010 to 2017, Washington State witnessed the sixth largest increase in population, edging its way toward gaining another seat if recent growth trends persist and if there's an accurate count is achieved in 2020. That's huge to me. Yeah, I see shaking heads. We all agree. What also is at stake? Data. Who uses data to drive nearly every decision that we make, right? Data-driven decisions, right? So this is huge. Um, any decision based on how many people would benefit or be impacted, think about all the questions. I've just listed a couple up there. And they might seem silly as far as, you know, flags that we should include in an art project um, or languages that we should translate into a notice. But we know that these are real issues. Um, so we're really going to make sure uh, that we have that data, right? And if we don't have that accurate data, we know that we will we'll be Organizations like myself and government will be making decisions that aren't accurate for our actual community. So um, we need to make strategic decision, decisions for programs and services that are based on questions such as who are we serving and what are their needs. Um, and those really rely, again, on an accurate census. All of our transportation, utility, parks and rec, emergency management, housing and land use plans are based on population data derived from the census. Census data also helps us evaluate our performance and how well we are doing. Um, were our programs and services accessible to everyone? Are we recruiting staff who reflect the demographics of our population? Who is most impacted by the lack of affordable housing and what does that mean in terms of their opportunity for achieving their potential? King County elections, I use census data all the time. When we first started talking this afternoon about those ba ballot drop boxes, got 10, need to do more than 10, know that, right? But where am I going to put those other 56 locations? I specifically looked at demographics. What we looked at is where is the lowest voter registration rate, where is the lowest voter turnout rate, and what does the census data tell us? It matches the same area where you would see low voter turnout and low voter registrations and demographics with limited English proficient communities, low income, people of color. It matches the exact same geographical areas in King County. 
And that's why we placed our drop boxes in places that are historically underserved and under, um, underrepresented, marginalized communities. So we use it all the time in elections. We also use it for language requirements. Across this country, data specifically from the census is used in determining what languages election departments are going to provide ballots and voting materials in. The Department of Justice looks at census information to make that determination. We don't in King County, we say we're going to go a step above that and we're going to use any data. But every other jurisdiction in this country is using data specifically from the census in order to provide materials in different languages. So I think that that, of course, is really important. So not only drop box placement or election materials and languages, precinct alterations, um, vote centers. We're going to go to same day voter registration this year and we're going to place vote centers. Um, and so uh, the Washington State Voting Rights Act um, as well. So that's just some of the key areas in which election uses it. So hard to count populations. Um, I'm not going to read to you what's up there. I think that if you haven't ha had it provided, I can also provide it to you. I'm not sure where I'm at with my 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but some of the things that I think are especially challenging are due to, of course, I guess probably the obvious that we're all feeling a lot of concern about, the citizenship question, a general distrust of government, the internet being the preferred medium for self-response, a tight job market leading to challenges with the recruiting census workers, competing news. Anyone have any idea what's happening next year that I might be a little bit busy with? The presidential election, yes. Reduced federal funding for outreach. So on the east side, the challenge will be raising people's awareness, I think, of the importance of the census. This will be a challenge due to our large, hard-to-count populations, including, and I've listed some of them up there, but I think it's really important that, you know, we talk about that, about a little more than 34,000 Bellevue residents were not United States citizens in 2017. Um, young children, zero to four, who compromised over or comprised over 5% of Bellevue's population, and people living in low-income households and households without access to the internet, and people living in overcrowded households. I know a little bit about counting. That's pretty much our job at elections, right? Um, it's basically what we do. Um, and since I took office, one of the primary objectives has been eliminating barriers to participation and ensuring everyone has the opportunity to be counted. We put in place some strategies that have helped us better connect with hard to reach communities. Basically, the funnest part of my entire job, one of my favorite programs that we have done in the last three and a half years, it's called the Voter Education Fund. It's where King County government got together with Seattle Foundation, a philanthropic group, to leverage money to provide our community-based organizations with funding, actual dollars to support the work that they do. Um, show you a picture of our most recent cohort of the Voter Education Fund. This is at our office. Uh, we are located in Renton. Just got to put a couple of election plugs out there. If you'd love a tour, I love to give tours. Um, we've got 90,000 square feet of just a bunch of election cool equipment that you could geek out on and I could show you the process. It's pretty exciting. So in Renton, I'm happy to give you a tour. Um, but this is the Voter Education Fund. So this is the fourth year that we we have uh, got together with the Seattle Foundation. We are putting approximately half a million dollars back into community-based organizations, a lot of them who have already been doing civic education work for years, if not decades, right? Um, and so what we're doing is we're leveraging um, the work that the community organizations are already doing to go out and do civic engagement, outreach, um, encourage people not only to get registered to vote, but to vote and to help people navigate what voting looks like in Washington State and in King County. 
Um, so what we do is, in the last cohort, we had 33 community-based organizations out of 72 applicants that we were able to provide grant funding, anywhere from $5,000 to $15,000, again, to support them in voter education and outreach work that they're, that they're doing. Um, and so our belief is to fund and support community-based organizations to engage their respective communities, right? How I reach out to the Latino community is going to be different than how I would reach out to the Somalian community. Um, how we reach out to our voters that are experiencing homelessness and their needs are different than um, that voters have a disability. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to support groups like Real Change, um, like Washington Bus, like APACE, like ACRS, um, a whole host of organizations that are working with limited English proficient communities, um, LGBTQ communities, people experiencing homelessness, people with disabilities, um, people of color, um, low income youth, people that have been incarcerated, and we're leveraging and giving actual money dollars to those community boards based organizations to provide outreach in their specific communities. And I think that that's a really great model. Um, I guess I'm probably a little bit biased on that since we came up with it, or since we, we actually, of course, looked at a lot of organize, a lot of governments that have done that across the country. I think it's really great news. I think it's really great news that King County and the Seattle Foundation are teaming up to provide a similar program for census education and outreach through the Regional Census Fund. Um, with a $1 million investment, we're really going to be able to help empower trusted messengers and organizations to ensure a complete accurate count in communities throughout the nation's 13th largest county. So there's my information. If you guys have, if you want a tour of the Renton building, I'd love to do it. Um, to raise awareness of the 2020 census, we need to educate ourselves, right? I suppose that's why some of us, at least myself, are here today. So that we can provide people to, we meet with complete and correct information about why the 2020 census is so important, how it will be conducted, where they can get answers to their questions, and how they can help ensure others have all the information they need to make an informed decision about participating in this coming census. So I hope I've described a little bit about why it's important to us as individuals, to our families, and to our communities. Um, here to speak to you next is Michael Hall from the United States Census, who will provide us with more information about the 2020 census, how it will be conducted, and all the operations that go into making it happen over the next year. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for the great work that you are already doing and the great work that you're going to be doing in the next 361 days and there on out. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Julie. And uh, as Director Wise mentioned, um, next up we have Michael A. Hall. Um, who will be giving us a little bit of the perspective from the census. Um, and Mr. Hall uh, began his journey with the census in 1984. Um, after serving in various roles from Kansas, Dallas, to Charlotte, um, Mr. Hall is currently working in the Los Angeles region as the Assistant Regional Census Manager for the 2020 census. So this, is, uh, this will be his fourth census count. So please welcome Mr. Hall. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Julie, they didn't tell me or warn me about you, so I have to follow you. This is a big act to follow. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the census. Julie is giving you why all the information is so important and why each of you do in this room are very vital to the success of the 2020 census. Everybody listens to station W I I F M. W I I F M. I got people like, what is he talking about? What language is he speaking? That's not one of the 59 languages the census is going to have, W I F M. What's in it for me? <laughs> okay? Julie has explained what's in it for you and why it's so important that we get a complete and accurate census. So Julie, thank you so much for laying the foundation for that, and I appreciate that. All right? So we're here to make sure that we count everybody, and as Julie put it in her slide, we count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. That is so very vital important. I started out early in my career thinking that geography was not that important. Just count everybody. But if you don't put the people in the right place, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so I had to find it out and go from there. 
Okay. okay. So why do we conduct the decennial census? First of all, the Constitution said we have to do it. Okay. Julie has gone about and has given us prime examples of how important it is to get accurate data and the benefits from it. So we're following the Constitution. Next. The thing about the census is that the census data is used for the next 10 years. Okay, 10 years. Let's see, this is my fourth census. I was two years old when I started. So by the time I get 52 will be the next census <laughs> coming up here. So anyway, I'm looking here at her, some of the things that we do next year, census requirement determines congressional representation, distributes federal support for education, health, and infrastructure, and it runs about average of $2,300 per Washington state resident. The federal government allocates over $675 billion a year. $675 billion a year for the next 10 years based upon the census count. So for every person we miss in the state of Washington, in King County, you're going to miss them that funding for the next 10 years so Julie won't be able to get all of her boxes that she wants to put up because we don't know they're there. <laughs> so we got to make sure that we're doing everything we go. We talked about, she talked about redistricting the congressional, legislative, school districts. And how do you draw businesses here? I mean, you're here in the Northwest, here part of King County. You've got all these major corporations. You've got the high tech industry up here. You got, and what's drawing these people here? You're showing that you have the education here. You're showing that you have the workforce. You're showing that you've got the people here that they need to hire. You're showing that the other stats that they show, statistics they use to make decisions or relocate their businesses here. And it's based upon the census data that those corporations are using to make decisions to move into this area. I look at the fact that I look at the fact that I used to work in Dallas and JC Penney's moved their headquarters right outside the suburb in Dallas. They sent five of their top senior VPs to spend three days with me going over census data. That was before it was on the internet and all that. But they spent three days in my office, one on one with me, going through census data. They were making decisions about their headquarters and things and targeting they were going to do. Next please. As you notice here, as Julie already talked about, here's the funding uh, that was allocated. Now, George Washington University uh, does, this, does this study for all the states across the country, and they talk about how much money that the federal government allocates. And this is what, for FY16, uh, that, that the state of Washington got in federal funding based upon the census count. So every person you miss, it lowers that money. I'll tell you a real quick story. My mom, when her health was doing very good, used to make four or five lemon meringue pies with the meringue on the top of them. My older siblings and I, my, we are all grown, we would fight over who was going to get the last piece of lemon meringue pie. No, you already had five pieces. No, you already had four. Oh, well, that's mine over there. The federal government is going to allocate that $675 billion, so somebody going to spend that money. Will you get your fair share of that money? Thing you have to ask yourself. Next, please. Achieving an accurate 2020 census is challenging on many levels. Here are some of the things we got. We got a polarized society. Julie, you swear you didn't see my notes before I came up. <laughs> we have a polarized society. Distrust the government. We have presidential primary. Plus, we have not only we have presidential elections in 2020, but we also have the Summer Olympics. So we're going to have a lot of things competing for people's attention that you've got to look at going on here. The citizenship question. The Census Bureau has been mandated that we were to go forward. It's now in the Supreme Court. We will have to wait and see what the court says. But irregardless, if the citizenship question is on there, then each of you in this room are going to have to work that much harder to get the word out to people and understand that it's so much vital loss if they do not participate in the census. And it's going to make all of our jobs a lot harder. And uh, I will probably shrink another five or six inches if I have to go through all of that in helping people to get to count. Let's look at some of our hard to count populations, as, as Julie mentioned earlier. I'm glad that we have different people here from the different, different factors and working on some of the subgroups, but these are what our statistics show us as to hard to count people and groups in there, people with disabilities. Somebody said renters. Well, renters have a tendency to move more and don't give a care about 
this because I'm not I'm not long term here as much most renters. So they don't go. You got lingus, you got a limited English proficiency. You got foreign born. So there are a number of different things on there. Next, please. Okay, how are we improving for 2020? We're doing a re-engineering address canvassing. We used to go and wear out a lot of soles on shoes listing every address in the country which had a mailable address in there. We've used high tech this time. We got people that, cartographers that sit there and digitize and use resources to decide how to know where we're going. So we estimated we were able to do 70% of the country with cartography using maps and using other sources and things to pull it in. Approximately 30% of the country, we still got to knock on doors to verify, or, or actually knock on doors, excuse me, but actually go and verify those neighborhoods and making sure that we have all of the mass, all the addresses into our mass address files so that we can mail out since the questionnaire. We're going to optimize self-response. For the first time, we're offering people an opportunity to be able to, to uh, reply on the internet, but you don't have to, okay? My parents are 89 and 85 years old, living in Kansas City, Missouri. They ain't going online and filling out no census form, okay? They know their son works for the Census Bureau. They know that I have an important job of trying to get people to participate, but they ain't going to do that, okay? So, so for my parents who are not going to do it to other people like that, we're going to still make sure they get a paper form, okay? We're going to, we got all different methods, and we'll talk about that. We're going to use administrative records and third-party data to help us to reduce the burden and the cost of the census. We had to try to lower the tax base. And then we're re-engineering our field operations. By re-engineering our field operations, we're using handhelds. We're using iPhone 8s to go out there and do the job. And by the way, plug in for recruitment. Anybody that has a job, come work for us part-time. You don't have a job, come work for us. Students come work for us. Teachers come work for us. Come and work for us on a part-time basis. We want to hire people who live in the communities, know their communities. That's my public service announcement. All right? Thank you. All right? Next, how people are counted on 20 it depends on where they live. 95% of all people will be able to respond by internet or call a 800 number to have a questionnaire assistance center to get assistance to help them out in 13 different languages, okay? If they, and what we need this group to do is to help us identify, uh, someone told me there were 140 something different languages in the school district here, okay? Uh, we, don't, we only took the top 59 because of funding purposes. So we need you to help us by helping us to identify people who can help us translate to language and things we don't have so we can get the word out so we can count everybody once, only once in the right place. Very important. We also are going to do what's known as update leave in some areas where they're very, very rural areas where we couldn't get things done, where we actually going to go there and knock on that door and leave a questionnaire for someone to fill out. And then if they don't still respond, we're going to go and send somebody to knock on the door for non response follow up and go get that. And then we have a very remote uh, areas that we have that are so isolated that you're going to get there by boats or planes, helicopter, Alaska, <laughs> and some other areas will be doing things like that. So about 1% of the population. How do we conduct the census? Big picture overview. Establish word account, motivate people to respond, self-response, group quarters, okay? We got to count kind of people that don't live in traditional housing units, so group quarters. We got to have non-response follow, which is the most expensive operation we do, and then we have to tabulate the data and get it to you and release the data. By April the 1st, 2020, you will have the data for not only will you have it just for Washington State, but for King County down to the block group level and being able to help to redraw your lines for congressional, uh, for elections, for school boards, for a number of different things going to be going on. Next, please. Establish where to count and motivate people to respond. So we're going to do for all addresses where people could live. Your definition of a housing unit may not be the same as mine, so we have regulations that state what a, what a housing unit is. Is it protected from the elements? Does it, does it have a roof on it? Is a housing unit? Is a tent? We can use it. There are all different kinds of things you can use for a housing unit to be able to go in with it. All right. So we're re-engineering we're re -engineering how we're doing to do address cam for the 2020 census, which I asked and. And we know that there are also people living in group quarters and people experiencing homelessness. So we do have procedures to count homelessness. Now, here's where you come into the, into the fold for this, okay? You have the fold, we have the responsibility, and we're depending on you to help us to identify those services that, that cater toward the homeless populations. We don't know all of them with the Census Bureau, but you do. 
We got to tap up on the local knowledge. One thing I've learned and gotten my feelings hurt in my 40, 44th census I worked on, Michael Hall doesn't know everything. Michael Hall cannot do everything himself. Everybody don't trust me. Oh, come on. Everybody doesn't trust me. So I've got to get trusted voices out here that are going to sell and get people to understand, understand the importance of what we're doing here and why we're doing it. All right, motivating people. We're going to conduct non response follow up. But let me let you on a secret. You all are going to do such a great job of spreading the importance of the census. Each and every one of you and all of your closest friends are going to sell the census so well that those 465,000 people we estimate we're going to need to do non response follow up, people who don't respond to the census either online or calling us. You all are going to reduce that number, say the taxpayers a whole lot of money, and get everybody to fill out that questionnaire online or call into the questionnaire census center, or probably like I have to do, send my brother, my sister over to my parents and help them fill it out so we can get it anytime. Okay? So you do what you got to do. But we know that we're going to be able to depend on you to do that for us. Okay? What do we ask? Here are the questions here. Everybody gets asked the same set of questions. The asterisk on there is the citizenship. We will know from the Supreme Court ruling. I've heard that it's supposed to happen this month. I also heard July. But someone told me in Salem yesterday that it's April 23rd, 25th, or whatever the Supreme Court is happening. They may not come out the ruling, but they're having a hearing on this. And we will know whether we're going to have to ask the citizenship question or not. And then I'll start going talking to my psychiatrist and asking give me some sleeping pills at night if we have to go through that. So we will do this, all right? Here, here are the languages that we're going to be covering. 13 basic languages that the internet self responds that people will be able to respond and it'll be in these different 13 languages on here. Some households we're going to mail not only the postcard, but we're also going to mail the questionnaire and select number of households. We're using hard to count data scores and things to historically show where to make that decision at. I don't know where those are yet right now. They're still determining those, but we'll be sending that data. Uh, we'll be sending English and, and, and Spanish forms in some areas as well, too, in addition to the card. We're also going to have 13 uh, languages when you call into the telephone assistance centers to help. Plus, we're going to have TDD for you to be able to use. Our enumerators will have their information in English and in Spanish on the questionnaire on their phone, which they'll be able to do. But here's where we, where we, where we increase, but not quite there yet. We've got 59 languages where we have a card that we will say, we knock on your door, or you can't, and we'll ask you which one, show you the language card, and you point to which language it is, we will find somebody that speaks that language to help you out. Our partners are going to be working with us, helping us identify people who can speak that language for us. We want you to help us to get people to recruit that will be working for the Census Bureau that speak one of those 141 minus 59 languages that we don't that we don't have things for from right here about the school district here. That is a very vital and important role that you can play in helping us go. Plus we're going to have ASL plus Braille plus large print because some of us are getting older because we've been doing this for a while so we need a larger print to see what's going on. Okay. I talked about the different different things. Some people are going to have internet first, where we're going to encourage them to, to fill out it on the internet. But we realize that some people are going to have a choice and don't want to do it. So we already are looking at what areas are we going to send the questionnaire and the postcard. And then we're going to send them a second mailing out letter saying, hey, did you get it? <laughs> OK. And then we're going to send a third one if you haven't responded by time on a postcard. And then we're going to send a fourth one, a letter and a questionnaire out to you and say, come on now, please. And then, and then we're going to send you a fifth mail and say, well, we're starting to deploy people to knock on doors. If you don't want somebody knocking on your door, you better go online or you better call the questionnaire assistance center and get them to fill it out. And if they do it, we can instantly pull it back from the work because with new technology, we're going to sign work by when people available. Let's say I can only work Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday from 5 to 9, and I can work Saturday from, I can work Saturday from 9 to 5. Okay? If that's when you work, we will give you assignments based on that. So we will pull work out and give work accordingly to what the actual response. And we're going to have real-time response that we'll have so you can see where we're at down to the track level. 
Okay? Census confidentiality. I love this slide. Okay? We are very serious. I'm going to pull the others of the. We're very serious about confidentiality. Let's face it, there are a number of statistical gathering agencies across the, across the country that make money by collecting data. But what is the secret to the Census Bureau's success? Trusted voices and confidentiality. We are dead serious about that five-year, $250,000 fine for violating confidentiality, leaking out information to you. I have to take a test a reminding me of that every year and have to pass the test to remind me of that and show my score of what that I understand about confidentiality either during or after my employment. Okay, that's how serious we take confidentiality. And I'm going to tell y'all like I used to tell my kids. Don't go to jail for stealing the candy bar at 7-Eleven. Go ride Port Knox and make me proud of you. Okay, so we want to make sure that you understand that we take confidentiality very serious and we would love to make an example out of somebody, at least I would, <laughs> make an example out of somebody about violating confidentiality because I think it will send a strong message to everybody if they actually, if we actually had a proof of somebody doing that. But it's not, long, it's not only while you're working, but it's after you're working, the Census Bureau. So if I get, so if I get to retire, hopefully in the next three years, I get to retire, and I go back and say, I know you lease information. And I start telling people what I collect from the sins, and guess what? I, I could spend five of those years in jail, and I ain't got $250,000 because I still owe school loans on my daughter from going to college. Fortunately, my son went to University of Washington and got a scholarship, so I didn't have to pay for that. <laughs> okay? Uh, national and local partnerships. Um, you all have a lot of high tech, a lot of big businesses here. You got Amazon, you got Alaska Airlines, you got Starbucks, you got all these major corporations up here in, in Washington State up here that are here. We are working with them in various stages to become partners. They're asking us, what can we do for you to help you spread the census? But there are so many different people working with them and some of them, to be honest, have decided that while we're gonna work with you, we don't want to be publicly working with you right now because we're worried about that citizenship question. Okay, Walmart, for example, like a lot of our constituents are people who are going to be affected by the citizenship question. So we kind of line them on like, you know, we want to support you. We understand the importance of the citizenship. We'll work, but I ain't sure I want to sign any documents saying and you putting it out publicly with it. So we have to, we have to worry about, we have to be concerned about that. All right, I'm getting my sign. Next, leverage voices. You are the trusted voices, not me. They don't know me. I will, we will give you the words. I've got a wonderful partnership staff here. We're growing here with staff. They will be more than happy to help you to go out and spread importance. And as Julie said, all the different groups that are out there. We are hiring, okay? We have, we have an office already open in Seattle. The slide says July of 2019, but let me put a caveat that when you're space leasing, there are a number of things that can go wrong. So we're saying by, we have all the contracts and everything in place, but we got to make sure the build outs are done. We got to make sure that the equipment is got there for, for, for all these offices all across the country. And then we got to make sure the IT equipment is put in there. We got to make sure the managers are hired. So by September, we will have all these offices open in, in, in the state of Washington. Uh, where we'll have managers and people working, and the census is local, we want local people, okay? Here's some key dates, 2019, validate all residential units in the country. The advertising national campaign will actually start in January of 2020, start advertising going in. March 23rd will be the first day you'll be able to fill out your census questionnaire online, call the questionnaire census center uh, for it. Census Day, April 1, we're going to stand up on the corner of the United States and we're going to take a panoramic view of the country on the, and it's going to be as of, August, as, as of April 1st of 2020. You are going to have everybody prepared for that. Starting in April, we'll start going to some of the major colleges where the students are at before they try to get out here after finals and collect them because we count students where they go to school at. Because if your student, if that student is not there, another student is going to be there, so it's still going to be impact on that community. And then, uh, by the way, when non-response follow-up operations say, people still can respond. And if they respond online or they call it, we can pull them out of the database, nobody can still knock on their door. 
December 31st, 2020, those of you who have project management, we will get the president of resident population of the United States on December 31st, 2020, no later than that. And then, and by March the 31st of 2021, we will have the counts for the, for the, uh, for you to be able to do your redistricting and reallocations for all the states and counties cities. Uh, uh, what can we do? These are some sources that can help you to go in and, uh, things you can go to and look at to help us to go. And then we have next with connecting with us on different ways you can connect. We're trying to be social media and things with it. Thank you very much for your time. I will be at some of the workout groups, uh, breakout groups to be able to answer any additional questions. You can catch me afterwards. I'm not flying back to LA tonight. Uh, so I can stay and answer any questions that you have for me. If I can't answer, I got a sharp staff here that answer any questions I can't answer. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, wow, can we just give another hand to our speakers, to Director Wise and Michael A. Hall from the Census? Thank you very much. Um, so we're now going to turn our attention to a short uh, panel presentation by a small panel. Um, and we're going to bring our focus a little bit more to the specific issues and concerns that might uh, impact our communities here on the east side. Um, and so I'd like to introduce our panelists and feel free to come on up um, as I'm calling your name. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Debbie Lacey, co-founder and executive director of the Eastside Refugee and Immigrant Coalition, um, an organization, yeah, let's give her a hand. Let's give her a hand. Um, an organization that engages with local municipalities, organizations, and businesses to create welcoming and inclusive practices, policies, and investments through consultation, training, and convening community conversations. Um, also on the panel uh, will be Dylan Ordonez, uh, Director of External Relations for the Office of the King County Executive. Um, in that role, he manages relations on behalf of Executive Constantine with uh, constituent and community organizations within King County. Um, he also works with the inter intergovernmental affairs, communications, and policy teams on major countywide initiatives. Um, and lastly, joining them will be, again, Michael A. Hall, um, who we just heard from, um, who again serves as the Assistant Regional Census Manager with the Census. Please welcome our panelists. Um, and so I'll start off with a, a few questions for our panelists, and then we'll really kind of look to you all and kind of open it up to the floor, see what questions are already in the community. Maybe you had some walking in today. Maybe there's some that, that came to mind as you were watching the various presentations. Um, just want to caveat that there might be some questions that our panelists might not yet know the answers to. Um, and also, depending on time, we might not be able to get to everyone's questions. If either of those situations are the case, please keep your questions in mind um, and bring them to the breakout sessions, um, which we'll transition to after the panel. And so to start us off um, with the local perspective, um, I'll put our first question to you, Debbie. Um, what are some concerns about the census that you've been hearing from different communities here on the east side? Thanks, David, and thank all of you. Is this on? Yes, thank you. Um, I think this may, might begin the let's get real part of the, <laughs> of the event, um, just because I have been hearing some things. But before I answer that question, I would love to do um, a real quick poll of the audience. Uh, this I got from my friend uh, James Whitfield at Leadership Eastside. So what we're going to do is um, you're going to put up five fingers if you are ready to strongly encourage your family and friends, your community, to fill out that census. That would be at a five. All the way down to one, which means I'm, not, I'm really not there. I don't think I can strongly encourage my family and friends to do that. So hold up your hand of which number you're at. I see a lot of fives. I see a few threes. I see a couple ones. Okay, very good. Just wanted to get a, a sense of, um, of you all and how you're feeling at this point. And maybe you've been uh, uh, pro appropriately persuaded by Julie and Michael. So um, a couple things I've been hearing. Um, People are, first of all, a lot of people don't know about the census. The immigrants and refugees that I've been talking with, um, I was just talking at my son's school with two of my good friends, one's from Russia, one's from Okinawa, and they both had no idea that this was something that our government does. 
Uh, one of them um, was taken aback, the one from Russia, because she, her mom used to work for a um, comparable agency in Russia that did this same uh, count. And she herself, one of her first jobs was knocking on doors to follow up with people who weren't submitting their information. And she said people would not open the doors for sure, that there was a lot of mistrust, um, and that she herself um, did not plan to participate in, in the census here in the United States. Um, the other person just didn't know about it, and so she was happy to get the information and know that that was coming. So there's that happening. And then we have people who are very familiar with um, the census, but also very um, scared. They're, they're, they're fearful. They're fearful about how their information will be used. Um, when we say things like, well, there's Title um, 13, is it, um, that protects your rights, protects your privacy, um, here's what we hear back. Well, um, we've seen a lot of laws being violated lately by our federal government. We've seen a lot of things happen that are unconstitutional, and it's, um, those things go forward, and then there's lawsuits, but in the meantime, people's lives are being ruined. Or they say, well, um, there have been some uses of the census data that were legal but have harmed communities or put a lot of fear and distrust in us, like what happened during World War II with Japanese Americans, what's happened with Arab Americans since uh, post 9-11. So there, there's a lot of fear. And there's a lot of um, questions about what I think it comes down to when I hear from everybody is that there's this dilemma, call it a moral one if you'd like, between really getting the community good that's at stake, really understanding that. And, and, and many of them do. They see these same numbers and they think, this is important. There's a lot at stake if we don't count everyone. But they're weighing that against their assessment of their own personal security and their own family's security. And it's just a moral type of dilemma that I keep coming up against in conversations that I'm seeing with people, is they're trying to grapple with that. I want to do what's best for my community, what's best for um, my friends and family in the community so that we can get the dollars that we need to do these great programs and so we can be represented. But I'm worried. You know, I'm worried about the people um, in my family. I'm worried about my neighbors, people I know who are undocumented. So th those are some of the things that I'm, that I'm hearing, and, and there aren't easy answers for those, I think. Um, did you want me to see if there's other please, input yes. from yeah, please. anyone else? Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today. I'd just like to echo uh, about everything that Debbie has just said. Uh, we've been doing outreach in King County, across King County for uh, over a year now, and communities are concerned, communities are scared, and regardless of the citizenship question, just kind of the, the trust in government, with, um, in particular with this, this current administration, um, the fear is palpable. And, um, you know, I can jump up and down until I'm blue in the face like, uh, about Title 13 and, and other, other measures that are being put in place to kind of guarantee the safety of that information. But um, uh, as, as somebody who works for local government, somebody who works for government, community is not going to trust me. Um, uh, let's see. The uh, citizenship question was proposed by Commerce just over a year ago, the end of March 2018. And yes, it is immediately there were a number of lawsuits and there have been two decisions made by lower courts. It, I believe it is April 23rd, the date that the Supreme Court is going to hear the case. And the form, when does the form have to be finalized? Is that by June-ish? Well, we said June because we're scheduled to go, we're scheduled to go, we're scheduled to, go to print in June. Um, but we know that if we are forced to have to change or do things differently, that we will have to find a way to absorb the cost in order to be, to, in order to meet the mandate that the Supreme Court tells us we have to do. And I think that that decision is going to be a real crossroads of how communities organize, about how people uh, make decisions to participate or not, because right now there are entire communities where the leaders and people who are, are looked to are going to encourage folks not to participate, and and that will be, you know, to the to, you know, the uh, that particular our region's detriment. Um, but like Debbie said, people are are weighing weighing both sides, and it's really difficult to ask somebody to volunteer their personal information if they feel it's going to put their family at risk, and you know, near or long term. Because uh, ultimately, the data is going to be made public. It's going to be made uh, not down to the individual level, but to you know, city, 
uh, you know, census tract down to the block. And so while you wouldn't have, you know, be able to pick out that there's a, you know, a single person at one household, you'd be able to get a pretty good idea of looking at a map, a hyper-local map of, say, a high number of concentration of undocumented folks live in a particular neighborhood. So um, just really, really heavy stuff that we're hearing from community. And on top of the citizenship question, on top of the digital divide, um, I think that, uh, Michael, what you mentioned about uh, the fact that after the third or fourth postcard or letter that homes, households will eventually receive a paper form. I think that that's something that really resonates with folks and is important to, to, to um, remember as well. Um, I'm sure there's, there are more thoughts kicking around up here, but I'll just pass it on to Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that we are, we're quite aware of all of the concerns are that we're hearing here that are going on, and the Census Bureau is doing our best to implement a number of things to help prepare us, and that's why it's so vital that we have groups in here that can go out and push the benefits of things on it. Now, let's, let's go to every incident that has happened with the Census Bureau with data even though we didn't release individual data for the Japanese internment, we had aggregate data, but they were able to go in the areas. The, the, the law was strengthened to protect that as a result of that. When we had 9-11, it went back and the law was strengthened again to protect for, to, for, so every time we've had an incident where there have been cases that we didn't release individual data, but you were able to get down to a lower level. We put, for example, we put a disclosure review board together that has to review in headquarters in Washington of all the data that is released. And that disclosure review board has to make sure that it cannot violate or release your individual information or trying to protect it, getting down to the low levels. The lower level of geography you go to releasing data, the more wider the data is that you get that you're producing out to. Another thing that we're introducing that's new this time is called noise. Okay, what is noise? I understand that there are very, very multi, multi conductor computers out there that can take aggregate data and break it back down into the individual data. And you got to have a mainframe with mega money and all that to make it happen. And I ain't got one of them in my basement, okay? But I can tell you that with noise introductions in there, it prohibits you from being reversing to go back into the data to get detailed data. We're working with Microsoft. We're working with, we're working with Google. We have hackathons that we bring consultants in to see can you hack into our systems and get our data. We have, we have employees that we have, uh, we have periodic hacking sessions where employees get to take time off from their position and actually go in and see can you hack into our data to go in and look. So we are really trying to look at ways. Another thing we're asking partners to do and complete count committees to do is to actually go out there and then you hear things on social media, you see things aren't false. Please go back with something positive that's really happened. Because all we need, you know, if it's on the internet, it's true. <laughs> you know, so we need you to make sure that you are helping us in that area. Great. Well, thank you. Well, uh, in the interest of time, I want to open it up, see if there are any questions um, from you all present. Any questions coming to mind? Yes, here, sweet. What will happen if I simply choose not to answer? Can you repeat your question just so it's on the... What, what would happen if I simply choose not to answer or if I lie? Okay, we have a, we have call what's known the post enumeration survey, which is a QC process that we do. Uh, with. The QC process is so independent that once they start the, 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 the QC on there, I'm not even allowed to touch the doorknob to that room uh, because I'm involved with things. And as far as you refusing to lie, there is an actual penalty for not responding to the census, but the census bureau doesn't have any record anyone knows of where we've actually went out and found find someone. So what we'll do is that we're going to keep sending somebody to your house, knocking on your door till we track you down. And as a last resort, if we still can't get you and it's getting close to time for the cutoff on things, we're going to talk to a neighbor and say, how many people live in that household? Can you give me the approximate age? Can you give me? And we'll take imputations of data to fill out the rest of it and make it happen. But we will make sure that we're counting everybody as accurate as we can. Great. Thank you. Any other questions from our audience here? Yes, please, ma'am. 
since you're using so many different tools to count people, you know, internet, postcards, how are you going to make sure that there isn't a duplication? We are hiring a staff to just to look for duplications and to look for things like it. When I left Washington, D.C., moving out to L.A., one of the subject matter experts who's very high official in the bureau said, you scare me going to L.A. And I'm like, why? <laughs> he said, I can see you trying to find a way to connect with LeBron James and get LeBron James to say, take out your cell phone right now and answer the sentence that's so important and two million people go online and they go and don't have no postcard to match anything up and we gotta, hire, we gotta have all these people to match the data and make sure they, somebody in the household didn't respond already, making sure or the system crashes because we don't expect two million people all at the same second that LeBron says it and I said, I will wear that badge on honor proudly if I make that happen. But we are, we are putting in place procedures uh, to to be able to account for whether we have duplicate answers, uh, duplicate people. Uh, maybe the spouse did and the other one didn't tell the other one they did. I just didn't turn it in and, and then you call and you give yours in. And we have ways to QC and make that happen. I just want to speak to that too because um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, the, there's such a thing as an overcount. And um, in the last one, 2010, I think it was um, white U people in the U.S. were overcounted by about 1%, whereas communities of color tended to be undercounted, um, anywhere from, I think, 5% um, of Native Americans um, to 1.5% of Latinos, 2.5%, I think, of African Americans. So, um, and the overcount back then came from some, some of the areas areas were duplications because of um, people who owned more than one house, college students being away and filling out two different forms based on where they were. So um, I wonder if maybe with the new digital um, piece that that will help resolve some of those. Um, we're also going to be working with our libraries, community centers, and other kind of convening places where folks can come use computers. And um, I believe we are able to let the Census Bureau know that. So if they see, you know, 800 entries from the single, same IP address, like they know that that is associated with a communal spot. So they shouldn't just junk all those because it's, you know, somebody in their basement just trying to mess around. Thank you for bringing it up because that has been a question that's been raised numerous times about how many people, you know, how do we know that someone is not hacking and, and, and bots that are going in, filling out things for it. Our, our disclosure review board, they have, a, they have a cutoff point where they will start investigating and looking into it. They're going to be working with the regional office, the regional census centers, and we'll be working with our partners to say, oh, oh that's a faith-based center, that's a library. And we do have a national partnership with the American Library Association who are saying that all their libraries are going to be used. And as far as, as the undercount, overcount, that you're very valid on that, we have had, you know, and one of the things that we have is children is sometimes a challenge in the census. Some people say, well, my kid was born, was born March 31st. They're not a year old, so I don't count them. Okay. We also have split households. They count them in the parent, daddy's household. They count them in the mama household. Sometimes they don't count them at all in either household. So we have all those different things, and we are having statisticians and people that are looking at that data to help us to make sure that we're, we're trying to account for that. You know, last decennial was the most accurate census we've ever done, even with those high undercount and overcounts. Uh, it was still the most accurate census in history at 99 point something percent that we actually did for the overall nationwide, which we had despair, especially on, especially on uh, American and tribal lands. That was one of the highest undercounts that we had. Mm -hmm. And Thank Seattle you. King County had one of the highest response rates, I believe, in the country too, 2010. All right, yes. live here, we're this age, but I don't want to tell you X, Y, or Z. And so the, the question uh, being that if there are particular questions on the form that, that an individual did not want to complete, but they, and so partially filling out the form, how, like what happens then or how is that handled? We will accept your questionnaire, but somebody going to knock on your door most likely. 
to follow up to try to get the additional information. Um, we want as complete and accurate census because uh, we are making, there are so many decisions made on your data on there, on what you put in there, till we will go to every effort, but if we can't get it, if that's all we can get on there, we will take that, but our preference is to get more accountable data to help decision makers to be able to make decisions in the communities. Great, thank you. And I guess another question that I'll pose to you all, so if different parts of our communities here on the east side have varying needs and recommendations related to the census, um, how might an effort here on the east side uh, respond to those differences? I think that's one of the reasons why we're all here today. Um, I think that it's going to take a lot of specific outreach targeted to especially those hard to count communities. And we are relying on you and many others who aren't here today um, to help get that information out, to really inform communities about all these things that you've been hearing today and help prepare our whole community. Um, but I think that that's going to take all of us to have a really successful and whatever we de define success, but from the census point of view and from all of us who are concerned about losing funding and other resources and representation, that means a complete and accurate count. Um, and so to be successful with that, you know, that targeted um, specific outreach, and I, I really want to appeal to cities, um, particularly here, around both having an internal plan for how you will be involved in, in the census, and also, um, you know, we had the announcement recently about the fund, uh, the $1 million fund, uh, can County announced, um, and the Seattle Foundation is going to be partnering with King County to distribute those funds for outreach efforts specifically related to this. So some of you in this room um, are definitely eligible to apply for that funding when that when that comes out, which I believe is this summer, April 15. So, so we announced the fund this past Monday, April 1st, uh, one year out from Census Day, 2020, and our our goal is to open the RFP portal for applications on Monday, April 15th, and then uh, I believe we're going to close the portal on uh, May 15th. So it'll be open for about a month, and our goal is to quickly, um, you know, catalog the the responses. Uh, and get awards out uh, as soon as possible, hopefully by June, definitely by July, because you know communities uh, that are, are uh, getting organized and engaged and uh, concerned about the census, we need to get this money out the door yesterday. So that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Dylan, and I'm so pleased that you all have been advocating for that at the county level, and we certainly have too, and I just want to appeal again to our east side cities that having an internal plan, yes, is very important, but I think you're hearing today the importance of that community outreach and the relationships that many of our community li liaisons and community leaders have, and being able to help use those relationships to get this information out, and so um, would encourage when you get asks from your city staff regarding this fund, um, as a community advocate, I'm encouraging you to contribute to that because um, it is centralized, it's a pooled fund, and it helps all of us who might be applying for that money, um, helps it be with more ease, and we've been assured that money that goes in from East King County will come back out to East King County, and we'll have East Side representatives being part of that decision-making process as well. So uh, that's my plug for our investment as a community in being able to address the very things that you're talking about, David, with regards to how do we do this when there are so many different populations and communities on the east side. And uh, in uh, at the county, we're working with other jurisdictions. Uh, at the state, you know, we're working with the state, working with other counties. Our philosophy is to kind of align resources, align messaging, alignment, alignment, alignment. Because we don't want to be duplicative. We want to remove barriers to access the dollars. Um, so on the funding front, uh, I know that philanthropy, like the broader philanthropic community beyond the Seattle Foundation, uh, they're also working to raise money to get dollars to organizations, um, not just here in King County, but across the state. Uh, the Washington Census Alliance has been leading an effort down in Olympia to advocate funding f uh, from state legislators, and uh, the House budget proposed uh, House budget proposal included 12 million dollars, uh, and the Senate approved 15 or proposed 15 million dollars. So I believe that there will be some funds coming from the state, uh, assuming that it makes through uh, the end of the session. Uh, so there there is an effort, you know, beyond he just here in King County to uh, try to align dollars and make sure that those dollars are used strategically and in the best place possible to have the biggest impact. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Hi. 
Hi there. Um, so if that uh, citizenship question is on there, will that change your strategy of implementation? And how will you alleviate the concern from the communities that the information will not be misused? Our, we have a national advertising campaign with YNR out of New York City who are, have a contingency that they're planning to do some things. We also know that, you know, when we said we were going to have 465,000 people we budgeted to go, we know that number is going to grow up, it's going to increase. So we've got to have more people, hire more people, we've got to train more people, we've got to pay more people mileage, we've got to pay people more time. We're going to have to go knock on a whole lot more doors to follow up if that happens. And we have to complete the census, and we have to get an accurate census. So the cost will go up on the census and the taxpayer money is going to go up. So it's an implication from it. But we are committed to doing whatever it takes to put in the resources doing because December 31st, 2020, we will give the President of the United States, the resident population of the United States by December 31st for 2020. And um, I will put in a plug for uh, the need to get enumerators hired and fill these jobs that are at the Bureau. Um, I feel like the number is somewhere around 3,000 people will be hired by the Census Bureau in the state of Washington. So uh, the federal, the, hi the hiring process takes you know, a little while. It takes like four, five, six months. And so in order to have folks in place by this fall and next spring, but we need to make sure that uh, folks in our communities know that these jobs are available, that uh, we help them if they need help to apply for these jobs, and uh, you know, really make sure that we have folks filling these jobs that reflect our, the people that represent our communities. Uh, again, it goes back to the trusted messengers. And I think the stat is about one in five people who apply actually make it through the process. So if, if we need 3,000 people, then we need 15,000 people to apply in the state of Washington to fill these jobs. So please spread the word. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all. If there are further questions, um, that either you have right now or that come up here in moments, um, please carry them in with you um, to our breakout sessions. Um, and so can we just give a, a quick round of applause for our panelists? Thank you all. Um, and, and so, Michael, thank you for uh, really appealing to this group to, to help support um, this initiative, and particularly in in the way of um, participating in a communities count committee that is being formed here in East King County. And so this will be a uh, organizing group um, that, that will help guide some of these local strategies um, to help prepare our communities in the best way we can so, so they can um, fill out the census. Um, and, and make those choices. And we, just to be clear, there, there is no committee yet. Um, just, you know, behind the curtain, aha, there's no wizard. Um, the, and, and so part of what today is, is to invite you all to the extent that you're curious about it, um, to, to further engage with this process. And unless there are any dire questions about what is next, um, we're gonna break to a coffee break and we'll see you at 4.30 in the breakout sessions. Thank you.